Hello. Today we combine fire and flight in a way no phoenix, not even Pat herself, can match or mach. With all the media hoopla over the Wright Brothers centenary, some of it first class, some more Ryanair, we'll be looking at where powered flight goes next. Bigger, faster, quieter, and most importantly, will it one day be possible for tall people to fly long distances without ending up with the shape of the seat in front embossed on their knees? Although that last one's really more of a personal agenda, so we may not get round to it. First, something that's as Christmassy and as hogmaniacal as it gets. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Jack Frost nipping at your nose. Delete chestnuts, scrub the references to Jack Frost and noses. What's left? The open fire. And possibly the fact the song's sung by somebody called Cole. Whether it's the Vikings Yule Logs, the Celtic Solstice Pyres, the Resurrection by Fire of Sun Gods Attis and Mithras, whose traditional birthday a week today got borrowed by the Christians and never returned, or just what you roast those supermarket chestnuts on, we are inescapably engulfed in flame at this time of year. And there's another more destructive side to all this seasonal burning. It's around now that things start hotting up for fire brigades across the country. From small domestic blazes to towering infernos, there's a lot more to analysing a fire than working out where the extinguishers and exits are and just who's going to ring 999. Every incident may be different, but there's an increasing realisation that there are underlying patterns and that, in particular, understanding the sometimes surprising way that people and fires themselves behave can help make new buildings safer and survival more likely. With me is Professor Ed Gallier, whose team at the University of Greenwich have developed computer software which models how people behave in fires and how fires behave around people and also here is Professor Dave Purser um, from what used to be the Fire Research Service and now just calls itself FRS but is still part of the building research establishment at Garston in Hertfordshire. Dave is that right? Yeah he's got a thumbs That's up right. from me. We spent a lot of time negotiating that title. Um, um, Dave it's one of the sad certainties of this time of year that you know someone's Christmas tree will go up in flames because of a short in the lighting and somebody's open fire they're roasting that you know, the roasting those chestnuts on will get out of control. But are, are, we, are we getting any more savvy about fire safety? I mean, I'm certainly somebody who's got loads of smoke alarms in my house, and a lot of people I know have, so that's certainly an improvement. Yeah, you're right. Obviously, this time of year, there is a bit of a focus on, on fire. You do get the occasional Christmas tree fire, and, of course, you tend to get these situations where lots of people are gathered together, and there's always one or two very nasty um, tragedies where you get a whole family... Um, with the bad fire situation. And domestic fires, of course, are where most people die and get injured in, in this country. But are we getting smarter about it? I but mean, we are. You know, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of good things to say about it. I mean, one of the big things that we did a few years ago, which the UK is unique about, is the furniture fire regulations. We had a big problem with furniture fires some years ago. We changed the chemistry and the nature of the materials we use, so focusing on the way materials burn, better, more fire-friendly, fire retardants, fire eco-friendly fire retardants, things like that. There's been a lot of a lot of advances in the area. Nanotechnology is one of the nasty buzzwords we're all into these days. That's becoming a big thing in the way materials are controlled and designing better materials so your TV doesn't catch fire so easily. Okay. I wanted like to start with that burst of positivity because I'm afraid we are going to talk about fire and injury and escape and, and death. So let's start with the basics. When we get fatal fires, what are the main causes of death? Well, there's, there's sort of three things going on in any fire. There's, there's what the fire itself is doing, how quickly that's growing, how it spreads, and what we can do about that. There's the design of the building and the systems in the buildings, whether you've got good alarms, whether you've got fire suppressant systems or fire extinguishers or right. you know, sprinklers. And then there's really another key, key thing is what the people do right. and how they behave and then how they're affected by the smoke. And the way people are actually killed in fires and injured is nearly always due to smoke rather than burns. You're four times more likely to be um, poisoned by toxic smoke than you are actually by to be burned in a fire. So one of the areas we've focused on a lot is, is the way fires grow and smoke, toxic smoke spreads around a building. OK, well, I hope to cover as much of that as we can. But, um, uh, Gally, you've developed software <coughs> which, which shows how real fires behave. Now, I suppose the first question is, well, why do we need software to do this? Why can't we just observe the trail of destruction? Well, if we, if we rely simply on looking at uh, existing fires, fires that happened in the past, well, we would only know about the fires that happened in the past. And we couldn't really apply that to our novel building designs or our new aircraft designs or our new train designs. So we need tools that will simulate how the fire behaves accurately enough so that we can put them into these novel new building designs or aircraft designs and then see if the designs are fit for purpose. If they uh, um, uh, 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 prevent the fire from spreading very rapidly, if the smoke is going to move very rapidly through the building, will people have enough time to get out and so on. So it's very important to develop these tools. And at Greenwich we've developed 
the smart fire simulation tool that simulates the fire and the exodus uh, human behavior tool that simulates how people behave in fires and, and enables us to look at building designs and see if they're okay from fire and evacuation. Well, let's start with the smart fire first. There must be an enormous number of factors to weigh up. You've got the materials, you've got ventilation, you've That's got right. all the little bits of equipment that are lying around, or if it's a domestic fire, presumably those nicely wrapped Ninja Mutant Turtle presents. I mean, lots of different things can, can suddenly change how, how dangerous a situation is. That's right, and you need to take all of that into account when you're simulating the fire. I mean, the first thing that you've got to put into the, into the model is the actual structure of the building. And so we, we've enabled the smart fire software to read a CAD drawing so you can pull in the, the complex structure into the software. But then you need to put, look at things like the material properties. What type of materials are, are going to be present in the fire? What sort of wood are you going to have? What sort of plastic materials are you going to have? Uh, what's even the orientation of the materials will make a difference in terms of how the fire spreads. And then, as you said, the ventilation becomes quite important. Uh, how, is there a, a ventilation system, forced ventilation system, which will uh, help remove the smoke or help even propagate the smoke through, through the structure? So you need to take all of these things into account and simulate uh, um, uh, uh, how the fire will progress in this design. Yeah, I mean, many fires are actually quite small. And one of the big things, most domestic fires are actually in a very small enclosed place, like your own home. And so the fires themselves aren't big. They're not the big infernos that you often see on, on the press and things. You know, they are often very small, but small amounts of stuff burning and producing very poisonous fumes. And this is one of the things we need to worry about. Another thing is that even with an identical setup, you can get a fire going two ways. So several different ways. You know, it's quite difficult to predict exactly which way it's going to go. And so in software that's like we use and that Ed uses, one of the things we have to do is do lots of simulations with different, slightly different setups to find out the range of outcomes you can get. You've got to do sensitivity studies, and uh, right. it's really important to do that. Uh, one of the, uh, I think, one of the, the problems with some of the earlier software was that it was very, very very deterministic and doesn't, it really didn't matter what you did to it you just get one set of results and for example when you look at human behavior we know people behave very very differently and, and in fact if we ran an evacuation and we got all those people that evacuated and put them back inside the building and had some sort of magic wand that would erase their memory of what they just did and got them to evacuate again exactly the same way there'd be a very different outcome and so the software needs to be able to accommodate that and software so like the fact there's a whole kind of there's a random roll of the dice in, in there as indeed. well as all the, the structured in, stuff indeed people can make people will, will, will make different decisions given the same circumstances they repeat that they might make a different uh, make a different uh, decision does that also mean in terms of fire safety messages there's been a tendency in the past to put the emphasis on what people ought to do rather than on what people tend to do in it, these circumstances indeed I mean uh, 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 a, a lot of of cases people design procedures and design buildings for how they expect or want people to behave not how they actually behave yeah. I mean for example there's all sorts of weird things people do and we've got security video footage for example of what happens in real fires and you can see for example when the fire alarm goes off people don't actually rush out of the building they, they they'll sit around and wonder, well is that a false alarm or um, or is, should I go out? Um, and so on. And in fact, look at the fire. People actually, we've got security video footage of people in department stores, for example, with a blazing fire, and people are standing there looking at the fire. Or they're still queuing up at the till to pay when, when, the, sh when the shop's filling with smoke and fire. They're wondering if they're going to get a reduction, probably, I should think. I mean, I mean Dave, this is a problem, isn't it? The, the fire alarm problem is that most of us, fire alarm doesn't equal fire, it equals pointless trip out of office, down flights of stairs, standing in cold for ten minutes and then going back to desk. So we, we've been conditioned not to think of it as meaning danger, danger. Yeah, it all depends on the, on the circumstances you find yourselves in. If it's your fire alarm at home and you know what it sounds like, hopefully it will trigger you to do something about it. Mine Although, usually means bad cooking mistake. Something okay. like that, yeah. yeah. So you should be fairly used to that and yeah. hopefully if you've got your game plan worked out, yeah. which is your own local fire safety management for your home, yeah. You will have you've got yourself and your family trained to to jump up when you when they hear that noise and they'll they'll be triggered to do it. So it doesn't really matter what the particular noise is. It doesn't matter if we go from an alarm to a siren to a flashing light. Well, it does make some difference because if you're in a place where you're unfamiliar, like a a, a department store or something like that, 
and some weird buzzer sounds. Um, a lot of people just won't know what that's for, and they will, they will ignore it. It's not their place. They're not responsible. They leave it to the staff to tell them what to do. And so it's very important that the staff are well trained, and they know exactly what the thing means. But if you have something like a voice alarm system, then you can actually give people a message, and people tend to respond a bit better to that. It's not 100%, but it seems to be a bit better than just having some buzzer going off. The old wisdom, the old wisdom has been in the past that um, actually you don't want to give people too much information because and I'll use the horrible word that the media tend to use, people will panic. And in fact, what we know from uh, uh, studying past fires is that actually panic happens very, very rarely. People behave very rationally. Mm. And in fact, what over rationally, by the sound of well, it, or over calmly in well, some senses. In, in, yeah. some, in, some, in some circumstances, yeah. yes. But what the wisdom is now is you give people as much information as you can so that they'll make the right decisions with that information. So if you have a voice alarm where you're giving people instructions, that's much better than a, a buzzer going off. The more information you can give to people, uh, generally the better it is. And, they'll, and they tend to make the right decisions if they're given sufficient and accurate information. But isn't there a difference sometimes, Dave, between what's good for the individual and what's good collectively? I mean, maybe if we all marched out in an orderly fashion, that might be good, but for the person who pushes past and shoves the little old ladies out the way, well, maybe they they've just got a very highly enhanced sense of self-preservation. Well, you're talking about, really, as Ed was saying, the extreme situation. Mm. I mean, the best game plan anybody can have um, in these sort of situations is to, is, to, is to think in advance how you would get out of that building. If I check into a hotel now, I always right. check out the escape routes before I go to bed. And so if something happened, I would know where to go straight away. And, and, and as Ed's saying, we need to buy people time. And generally speaking, because fires grow sort of exponentially, they start slowly and go very, very quickly, there's always this bit at the beginning when there's usually plenty of time for people to get going if, if you can manage it right and if you can get people going quickly. And so if people start to go early, that's the good game plan. It's when it's left to the last minute that things get very hairy. But this presumably, Ed, is where human psychology interferes with this because our tendency is to not do anything until we absolutely know, we, we, you know there, is, there is an imperative upon us to get the hell out of Dodge. Indeed. I mean, uh, uh, that's why it's so important to provide good information. I mean, it, just hearing an alarm... Um, you're wondering, is it a false alarm? Is it another training uh, session? And maybe I can finish typing my document before I, l I leave my office. But if you actually have a voice, if you provide the people with the, with the right information to, to get them going, then they generally will get going. And there's been lots of tests to show this, where you can do, you can do a, a full-scale evacuation trials with the different types of alarm systems. So how do you put all this human variability, these differences of materials, the way the fact, as you said earlier, that the same people in the same circumstance on different occasions might behave differently and turn it into this Exodus computer model? Well, it, the model has all of these parameters built into it and, uh, and you also have to set particular parameters for the particular individual. So, for example, you might have to uh, uh, include some, some, some aged people, some disabled people, uh, 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 people who are, who are going to be asleep, for example. Uh, but the key thing is that the software is stochastic and so when you run the simulation once, uh, that just gives you one possibility. You've got to run it a number of times, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 times, and look at the distribution of the results that come out. And, and, and from that distribution, that's what you can actually base your conclusions on. Now, just as one example, you've got it set up here on a laptop in front of us, a model from the 1998, I think it was, Gothenburg that's Disco right. Fire in Sweden. Can you just very briefly run us, run us through what this is showing us? Well, what happened in the Gothenburg disaster, it was around about this time in, in 1998, and uh, it was a disco full of uh, young kids and a fire was uh, deliberately lit in one of the staircases, meaning one of the two ways out of this uh, two-storey building was actually blocked by the fire. The building was also crammed with people. There were about 400 kids in this uh, building, and the building was only actually um, uh, permitted to contain about 150. So you had an overcrowded building, and you had one of the exits blocked, and you had a very rapid fire that developed. And as what you can see in the, in the computer simulation running here is you can see the people trying to get out. And as you can see, there's a massive congestion by the exits. Yeah. And you can see people beginning to fall over, beginning to, to keel over, because they're inhaling the toxic gases and they're being affected by the radiation. And then other people the are stumbling as there are other people blocking in, them, I can indeed, see from the model. Indeed, yes. indeed. And, so, and, and what the model predicts is, for this particular simulation, trying to reproduce the actual event, we're, we're predicting about 90 fatalities will result from this fire. In actual fact, on the actual day, 63 people died. So we're pretty close to uh, what, was, what, what actually happened. And then presumably what you can look at is what would have happened if there were fewer people, what would have happened if there were more exits, what would have happened if the fire exactly. was somewhere else. Exactly. That's the beauty of using the tool. You can play all these what-if games. Now, 
on this other si simulation I'm showing you here, this is looking at the case where what would have happened if there were 150 people, the legal number of people in the building. And what the software shows, what the simulation shows, is that if there's only 150, even with this disastrous fire, and even with one of the exits blocked, everyone would have got out and no one would have been injured. In this other simulation I'm showing you here, we played another what-if scenario and we said what would have happened if there was one additional staircase and one additional exit, but still the 450 people in the building. And again it shows everyone would have got out. This time there would have been some minor injuries, but everyone would have got out of the building. Finally, Dave, and brief, there's lots more we could talk about here, but for those of us who don't want to end up as a future ed computer simulation, anything we can, single thing we can do to increase our odds of uh, surviving Christmas? Well, over Christmas, check out your game plan for getting out when something goes wrong. Keep an eye on the things you've got there. Put, look at those, the electricity on those, your supply on that Christmas tree, make sure it's not dodgy. Maybe um, choose a fire retarded Christmas tree if it's an artificial one, make sure it's got the right labelling on it. And um, if you've got a lot of family in there, make sure they've got a good game plan to get out if things do go wrong. Make sure there's battery in your smoke alarm. Exactly. Check your batteries. Check your batteries. OK, final <coughs> voice. Thank you very much, Professor Zalgilia and Dave Purser. Uh, thanks for that conflagration conversation. More on the genesis of Exodus and other revelations about fire safety on our soon-to-be-enhanced web pages, www.bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4 forward slash material world.